All right, so this is Psalm for Beginners. This is lesson number four in that series. And in this lesson, we're going to look at nature psalms, nature psalms. A little bit of review as we try to do each lesson. So far we've said the 150 psalms contained in the book of Psalms deal with different subject matter. And these can be grouped into nine general categories. And we've looked at those, wisdom psalms, nature psalms, that's the subject for tonight, word of God psalms, uh, penitential psalms, worship, suffering psalms, assurance psalms, praise psalms, and royal psalms, royal psalms. All right. Last week we studied the wisdom psalms, that first category, and we said that the wisdom psalms themselves could be subcategorized into three different types. You had the experience wisdom psalms, which were like proverbs. And sometimes at the, at the top, there was a notation by the author, you know, a maskil by David, or a mashal by uh, David. So uh, these terms were talking about experience psalms. And in those psalms, many times you saw the term selah, which was either a musical notation or a, a, um, a reference or an instruction to the reader to pause and consider what has just been, what has just been said. Also the, uh, experience, or the wisdom psalms were, um, also had another subcategory uh, as character psalms. And the character psalms under the wisdom heading uh, were those that ans uh, answered the question, how should a righteous man live? Who is the righteous person? And so the psalm would kind of answer that uh, question. And then ethical psalms under the wisdom uh, category. Ethical psalms were those that answered the question, why? Why does this happen? All right. Or what is the right thing to do? So experience, character, ethical. As I said, this week we're going to look at category number two, the psalms that talk about nature. There are many psalms which comment on the greatness of God as creator of all things and the majestic results of His handiwork. These are referred to as nature psalms. Um, an example in the New Testament of this type of psalm uh, in Matthew 5.45 it says, He makes His sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Here's an example of a nature type psalm being referenced in the New Testament by Jesus. The Bible declares that God works for man's benefit through the things that He has created. Okay, that's, that's a biblical concept. God works for man's benefit through the things that he has created. In Genesis chapter two, verses two and three, it says that God rested from all his work. This doesn't mean he stopped altogether. It doesn't mean he had to rest because he was tired. It merely uh, declares that God completed his creative activity, but he continues to bless man through what he has already created. In Colossians 1.16, Paul says that everything was created by God through Christ. And in verse 17, it says that all things are continually held together. Not they were held together or they were put together. It speaks in the present tense. They're continually held together now in the present tense by Christ. So what does that mean? Like theologically, what does that mean? Well, it means a present active involvement in maintaining the universe and the life within the universe. God is active in that. So if God actively sustains the creation through Christ, what does that mean? Well, it means that our prayers for sustained or restored health or protection and blessing from the elements for food these things are not in vain, but exactly in line with a God who controls everything in the universe and who hears prayer. That's the difference between a miracle and providence, God's miraculous work. 
He raises, Jesus raises somebody from the dead. That's a miracle. He takes a few pieces of bread and fish. He feeds 5,000 plus people. That's a miracle. He says to the storm, stop, and the storm stops. He says to the waves, stop, and they're calm. That's a miracle. His miraculous work. But he also works providentially. His providential work is, I pray, Lord, please help me with this, and we receive the help we need. Lord, please provide for my family, and somehow uh, you know, things work together to provide for family. That is God's providential care, and His providential care is quite spectacular at times. We're deathly ill and we cry out to God for help, and we're healed. You know those stories when they say the doctor said, well, this person didn't have a chance. You know, we don't give them more than three months to live and all of a sudden the tumor or the cancer goes away and, and they're restored and they live on another 50 years or whatever. What is that? People call that a miracle. No, 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 that's God's providential care. A miracle is if uh, uh, you have a train accident and your arm is cut off, okay? And then all of a sudden another arm grows from your, <laughs> from your shoulder. That's a miracle. but that the disease within you regresses, that your own body is able to fight it off, or that a tumor disappears, we don't exactly understand how, God's providence. So I don't want to get lost in that idea, I'm just making the point that the nature psalms celebrate this reality of God's creation and most importantly, His continued presence in the universe, he, he didn't just wind it up and let it go by itself. We're not deists. Deists are people that say, oh yeah, there's a God, He made everything, everything was created, and then He just stepped back and just let it happen. Those are deists. We're not deists, we're theists. We believe that God created everything and continues to work dynamically within history, with man man, woman. So let's look at some of these. Psalm 8. In Psalm 8 the psalmist comments on God's greatness as it is displayed in His creation and in mankind. And he introduces these two manifestations of God's glory in verse 1 and 2. So in uh, Psalm chapter 8 verse 1 the writer says, O Lord our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth who have displayed your splendor above the heaven. Doesn't that sound like a song we sing? Exactly, that's a song that we sing. What's interesting here about this nature psalm, the two words Lord, you know, O Lord, our Lord, they're not the same word in Hebrew, in the Hebrew. The first Lord is Jehovah, God's name, I am. The second Lord is sovereign lordship, the position the authority. And so the Lord's excellent character is witnessed to by the heavens, by the creation, the author says. To see the beauty of the creation is to see the greatness of God. In other words, how marvelous, how marvelous it is to see the stars. You know those, 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 those uh, pictures uh, from the Hubble telescope? You know those more close up pictures, and it almost looks like a cloud. You know, there's one, it looks like a cloud, and within the cloud there are some bright spots there. Those are stars. And I used to think, oh yeah, well, there's a those are the clouds, and look at all those bright spots. What I didn't realize is that cloud is made up of stars. <laughs> what we think is just mist. Every particle there, which we think is some sort of mist or cloud in the heavens, is really made up of all of billions of stars and the, the ones that are bright are stars that are you know, larger and give off more light than the others. So even without the telescope and modern technology, the psalmist is saying, how majestic is your name in all the earth we have displayed your splendor above in the heavens. We see how great you are just by looking up at the sky. Verse two. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. So the first witness is what is going on in the, in, in the heavens. The second witness of God's glory is in the humble state of mankind, especially when as a child 
he recognizes and appreciates the handiwork of God. The idea being the simplicity of a child's understanding of God's creative work has the power to silence unbelievers and scoffers and opponents of revelation. How do we, where do we get this idea? In Matthew 21 verses 15 and 16, remember this, this occasion here? It says, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus, or He had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself? Here Jesus is referring to this idea that was in the Psalms, okay? And he's saying this to the leaders, haven't you read the Psalms? Where the psalmist is saying, not only in the heavens, is there a declaration of God's greatness? Even the small children recognize that the skies are great and the sun is big and the moon is out at night and they praise God from their you know, young minds and young hearts. So now the author goes back to expand the idea of God's glory seen in the universe. Uh, this is done to establish a basis for further reference to man's position a little bit later on. So let's go back to Psalm 8, verse 3. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. So he reaffirms that the heavens, all of them, are the direct result of God's, and here's the thing, are the direct result of God's conscious creation. It wasn't an accident, it wasn't an explosion, it was a conscious creation. Note the use of the synonymous parallelism that we learned a little while back. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, there's the first stick. Second stick, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, saying the same thing except saying it in just two different ways, right? Now, the author goes back to expand the idea of creation of man and how after the mighty heavens are created, God judged that man, who seems so small and insignificant in comparison, should be the crown of his creation. Uh, and in this, the author sees how glorious God truly is. So let's read verse four. He says, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you, you care for him? So when the author sees the moon and the stars and the power of nature, and then he looks at man, he wonders out loud why God has, has a constant place in his mind for man. After all, he's so small in comparison to the stars. And so David answers this question. You know, man is so small and yet God constantly cares for him. Why? So we go to verse five. Yet you have made him a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty. And so David answers his own question. He says, man's greatness is found in the fact that in comparison to everything in nature, God has made man to resemble himself more than any other thing that has been created, whether great or small. I mean, a trillion stars together are not greater than one human being. Why? Because one human being is made in the image of God and stars, no matter how many you have of them, are not. So man's val value is not based on size or strength or power, but rather in his resemblance to God. Nothing else in creation, animal or plant, has this position. This is man's honor and his glory. And the writer is bringing this out by comparing man to nature, to the creation. Let's keep going, verse six to eight. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the seas, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. So man's glory and honor is attested to by the fact that he is the head of all creation. Yeah, creation is great, look at the stars. And yet, God has put man at the head of creation. 
you know, he is the frailest in creation, but he rules over it. Of course, not to exploit creation for his own interest, but to manage creation to God's glory. So this total submission will ultimately be manifested when Christ comes. We read about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Now for the author, this wonderful paradox that the fantastic and powerful creation which glorifies God, this thing is in subjection to its frailest member in whom the image of God resides. He says, wow, you know, that just blows my mind when I think about that. How great everything is that you've created God and yet <laughs> you've put all of it in subjection to, to, to man, to mankind. And so um, this contrast is in itself a cause for praising the wisdom and the greatness of God. And this he does in verse nine. I don't know if I've got verse nine here. Uh, yeah, I'll show you that in a minute. I want you to just look at a couple of interesting things about this psalm here. First of all, the synonymous parallelism that we see, you know, he repeats the same idea over and over again. In verse six, in verse seven and eight, there's synthetic parallelism where he is kind of, he says one thing and then he builds on it. You, you know, you're in charge of this, plus the animals, plus the fish, plus all the fish in the sea, you know, synthetic parallelism. He builds, okay? And then verses one and nine are similar, like the refrain in a song. The first verse is, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Verse nine, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's like a song. You know, he opens with a, a refrain, he closes the psalm with the, with the same refrain. And also um, the, the balance of ideas. Remember I told you um, Hebrew poetry is very subtle, you know, it doesn't shout out at you, it's very subtle the little tricks that they do, but how beautifully balanced this uh, poem is. You have praise, O Lord our Lord, in verse one and two. Then he talks about the creation, how magnificent it is in verse three. Then he talks about mankind, how, how wonderful mankind is, you know, the fact that the frailest is in charge of the whole thing. And then he finishes with praise. Praise, creation, man, praise. Beautiful symmetry of poetry. That was Psalm eight. Let's look at one other, Psalm 19. <clears throat> This is an interesting psalm, 19, because it demonstrates two categories of psalms in one psalm, one poem. It is a nature psalm in verses one to six, and then it's a word psalm in verses seven to 14. The author here is balancing two ideas in this poem in order to make a single point. In verse one to six, he shows that man can acquire knowledge of God through the physical universe and uses, nature, uh, uses a nature psalm uh, and the style of a nature psalm to say this. We can find out about God by looking around at creation or at nature, all right? Then in verses seven to 14, he concludes that man can also acquire knowledge of God through instruction from the law. In other words, from God's word. And his point is that one can know God from the physical or the moral realm, and that without the light from the sun or the light from the spiritual revelation in his word, all life would fail. So having you know, seen the overview, let's look at Psalm 19 verse one. We're only going to cover the nature part of this Psalm this week and then next week when we do word psalms, we'll look at the last half of this, all right? So verse one, he said, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. Does that not sound familiar? Right? Then he says, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands, synonymous parallelism. The heavens are telling, right? The glory of God, second, second stick, and their expanse. What's the expanse? Well, the expanse of the heavens and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. What is the glory of God? Well, the glory of God are the things that he's made. In the second stick, it says, is declaring not his glory, but rather declaring the work of his hands. Just a different way of saying his glory. 
First stick, he says, the things that God make, they're, they're glorious. Second stick, he, he describes what God does by saying the work of his hands. Synonymous parallelism. Uh, he personifies the heavens as someone who is by sheer presence making a declaration about God's glory and power. Now today, we're able to count and measure the stars and so our awareness of them only magnifies this declaration. The Jews could not count as far as we can count today. You know, they didn't have the concept of billion and trillion. That, that, that didn't exist in their, in, their, in their thinking, in their mathematical thinking. So for them, it was, uh, they would say things like, as many as the, the, the sand on the seashore, you know, referring to you know, what we would say billions or trillions today. All right. Verse two, day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. See the synonymous parallelism there? Saying the same thing. Up in the heavens, the heavens are telling us something. They tell us something in the daytime, they tell us something at night, but they're telling us something. And so this declaration goes on from day to night to the following day as each array of moon and stars is followed by the great sun to continue this declaration without ceasing. Day and night, the heavens are telling us how wonderful God is. All right? Verse three to four a. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Synonymous, parallelism. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. More synonymous, parallelism. And so the author now is saying, they, meaning the expanse, the heavens, the wonder of the heavens, they, they don't speak words, he says, and they don't make any kind of noise, but their witness is universal. Everybody sees them. In other words, the message of the heavens is the same to everyone, no matter what language they speak. 4b to 6, in them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. And so the, the greatest of witnesses is the sun, which, is the author's, which the author says is like a bridegroom in his brilliance and in, 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 and in his beauty. The sun was not to be worshiped, but rather a mighty witness each day as it crossed the sky. The tent he's talking about is the sky of God's presence and power. In other words, you see the sun more powerful because the stars, you can see them, but you can't feel them. But the sun, you can both see and you can feel it. So his presence is much more magnified. And the same God who made all those stars that you can see and not feel is the same God who made the sun, which you positively can see, and you can see the sun from anywhere on earth, and it, it affects you in some way, no matter where you are on earth. All right? So that declares God's presence, God's power, very visible and needed by every creature. So this thought of light from the sun will serve as a bridge to the next passage where the author is going to discuss light, but not light from the sun. He's going to talk about the light that men receive from God's word. So he uses this as a bridge, an idea bridge, to go from a nature psalm to a word psalm. And in the word psalm, he's going to talk about the light that we receive, not from the heavenly sky, the light that we receive from God's word. And we're going to look at that next time. All right, let me just summarize some of the stuff that we've talked about tonight, and then we'll do the quiz. Number one, nature psalms usually point to the creation as a whole, or some part of it, as a witness to God's wisdom, greatness, and power. The, wit, the, the nature psalms don't just talk about how wonderful is nature and how beautiful are the flowers and how mighty is the river. You know, men's poetry might do that, but nature poetry in the psalms always uses nature as a way to witness God's power, His strength, His kindness, His beauty, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, secondly, these psalms are excellent sources for a variety of uses for the Christian. They are, first of all, uh, useful for praise, to praise God's creation and His power. You know, if you're running out of words to say when you pray, you know, I, I seem to be praying the same words over and over again, God, I'm getting a little dry, I'm getting bored with myself. Try opening the Psalms. Try reading the Psalms out loud as if you were speaking them to God and you will gain a new vocabulary for your personal intimate prayer life. And the nature Psalms are great Psalms to offer praise with. Also, they're useful to demonstrate and to confirm the idea of creation that this is how the world came to be and God's ongoing work within creation. In other words, it's okay to pray for good crops. It's okay to pray for rain. It's okay to ask for protection. We're not just on autopilot here. And somebody says, well, what does it say that God you know, interferes or does? Yeah, Psalm 8. You don't have to believe that. I tell people, you don't have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You don't have to believe that God created the world. You don't have to believe that God is involved in, intimately in, in, the, in the affairs of human beings, in our affairs, that we pray for all kinds of things. My biggest mistake is sometimes I won't pray for something because it's too small. It's like, oh, I feel like such a jerk. You know, what a wimp praying for such a small thing. There are people dying out there. There are people being bombed out there. And here I am, par I'm praying to get a parking spot. You know, come on. And lo and behold, there's the parking spot. Nothing is too small and nothing is too great as a subject of prayer. We're the ones who are impatient with our children when they say, Mommy, can I have this? Can I have that? Oh, Daddy, can I go with you? Blah, 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 blah. We're the ones who are impatient. And somehow we think God is impatient with us. No, no, that's our problem. That's not His problem. He's eager to answer our prayers. He wants us. You know, what is the Bible? You know, <laughs> the simplest scripture to remember for prayer, like what Paul says, pray always. If you doubt you should be praying in a particular situation for a particular thing, the Bible says, pray always, all the time. Pray without ceasing. So the nature Psalms are good apologetics to show where does the Bible teach this? And I'm sorry, I didn't, forget, I didn't finish my other thought. People can say, oh, I, you know, I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or I don't believe that God created, I don't believe that. You are free to not believe. But you, what you cannot do is say that the Bible doesn't say that. So you can reject what the Bible said. You're free to do that. You know, that that's, that'll be on you one day. But you cannot say that the Bible doesn't teach that we ought to pray for the rain and for our food and for help or whatever. Yeah, the Bible does teach that. That's what I mean about the apologetic nature of the Psalms, all right? One other thing. Uh, they're good reminders that the creation has brought into being two, for two main reasons. One, to be a witness to the glory of God. I mean, do we really need a trillion stars? I, you know, really, do we need a billion stars? I don't know, I don't, I don't think so, not my wisdom. Why are they there? Well, to give glory to God. Three stars, I think just three stars would be enough to give glory to God. You know, who can make a star? But a couple of billion stars, you see what I'm saying? It's overkill, I get it, but that's why we're in awe. And secondly, the creation was made, right? To do what? To witness the glory of God. And secondly, to sustain mankind. The oil's in the ground for us to get it out of the ground to power what we need to power. The, the apples are on the trees for us to eat. The fish are there for us to catch and eat. The animals are there for us to eat or to carry loads. That's what, he made all of this for us. After the fall of man, the creation has become less a witness because of the effects of the flood on nature and man's stewardship of the earth has been poor 
Because of what? Because of greed and ignorance. You know, most famines are not caused simply because there's not enough rain. Most of them are caused because of man's improper management of the earth or greed. Let's cut down all the trees so we can make money. We don't have to plant any, oh yeah, and then the rain comes and washes everything away, we can't plant crops, you know. But we can still see God's presence in the mighty array of the heavens and Jesus has promised to save us from this earth which one day He will destroy with intense heat. Okay, so that's Nature Psalms. We're going to continue with our different kind of psalms next time. Let us do our little quiz right now. So get your quiz out. It says on the book of Psalms, it's just one page. Again, I realize many of you have not taken every one of these classes. Uh, some of you are just here for the first time and some of you just have a bad memory. So <laughs> it will accommodate all. But I just thought it'd be fun to do this, uh, this little quiz. So I, you got you got five minutes to do it, five minutes to correct. Go. Okay, I'm going to start giving the answers. So Book of Psalms review quiz, number one, match the correct word with the statement. So number one, Hebrew for praises is, anybody? Letter what? J. Not letter J. Not letter H. Number is letter E, Tehilim. All right, number two, song of praise. Which letter matches song of praise? J, correct. Number three, who wrote the oldest psalm? Number D, Moses wrote the oldest psalm. Number four, lessons, parables. Which letter? What'd you say? G, a mashal, yes, a mashal. I, I mentioned it tonight, I slipped it in. Number five, part of a line of poetry. I, stick, a stick. Verses are broken into sticks. Number six, Greek word for praise. Nope, uh, yes, 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 yes. Greek word for praise, C, salmoi. Number seven, rite of psalms. Writer, it should be writer of psalms. Ah. Oh. You would say it would be letter, <laughs> it would be letter A. Asaph was a writer of psalms. Uh, number eight, a group of psalms. A special group of psalms. Who? H. Hallel, the Hallel, remember Psalm 15, 16, 17, you know, they sang those psalms at the, the Last Supper. They sang a song and then they went to the garden, the Hallel. Number nine, expressive poetry. B, lyric, very good. Wisdom poetry. Number F, nomic. All right, very good. Anybody get all 10 right? I just want to know, anybody get all 10 right? I want to give you your props. Okay, that's good. That's all we're going to do. Answer true or false. All right, real fast. David is the author of the book of Psalms. False. False, oh, that was a trick question. He wrote most of the Psalms, but he's not the author of the whole book. Very good. And number two, Psalms is the most quoted book in the New Testament. True. Number three, a woman wrote a, woman wrote a Psalm. A woman wrote a psalm, true. Number four, certain psalms are repeated in the Old Testament, true. Number five, the book of Psalms is divided into 10 sections, false, nine sections. Number six, the book of Psalms was once used as a song book in the church, true. Number seven, the paean is a song of lament, false. Number eight, many psalms have pronounced rhyme scheme, false. Have a pronounced, no, there is no rhyme scheme. If there's rhyme, it's by accident. <laughs> Number nine, maskil is a literary device used in the Psalms. False. <laughs> maskil is a type of Psalm. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a type of Psalm, wisdom Psalm. Uh, number 10, acrostics were Psalms that used each of the 24 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. True, yes, very good. Anybody get 10? 
No props yet, okay. Number three, circle the correct word. The main literary device used in the Psalms is assonance or parallelism. Very good, number two, Psalms can be divided into five or nine categories. Nine, very good. How should a good man live before God is a question asked by experience, character, or psalm? Character. Number four, psalms that celebrate the wonder of God's creation are called? Nature psalm. Anybody get all four? Hey, way to go. Okay. Uh, we circled all four, yeah, very good. All right. How are we doing? 801, not bad, not bad. There will not be many tests like this, but I just thought that would be fun to just, you know, see what we know. <laughs>